exploring our home away from home. The dogs are in the back. Let's go. On our camping trip to Tennessee, we visited many different interesting places. We went to Mammoth Cave, Great Smoky Mountain National Park, Cades Cove, Newfound Gap, Clingman's Dome, the Appalachian Trail, the Museum of Salt and Pepper Shakers, and various antique shops. One of my favorite places we went was the Biltmore House, the largest private house in America. Biltmore House is much more than just a grand house on a great piece of property. Biltmore House is a trip back in time, not only to the Gilded Age, but also to a time of the birth of environmental science. The approach road winds for three miles through a deliberately controlled landscape. The road runs along the ravines instead of ridges, creating a deep natural forest with pools, springs, and streams. Around the last turn, the visitor passes through the iron gates and pillars that are topped with by early 19th century French stone sphinxes, and then into the expansive court of the house. Today we can hardly believe this beautiful and pristine woodlands was built on desolate and played out farmland. All of the forest was actually planned and planted. George Washington Vanderbilt was born on November 18, 1862. The youngest of eight children, George was a shy, quiet person. He exhibited little interest in business affairs. He was influenced by the collection of art and antiques in his father's house and began collecting books and art objects at an early age. George had no interest in social world that so captivated the Vanderbilt family, preferring instead the adventure of travel and the world of books. On a trip with his mother in 1888, he visited Asheville, North Carolina, a fashionable resort in the 1880s. Here he decided to create a home for himself, a refuge from the tumult of the city. He soon began purchasing to 125,000 acres of land. The farmers were more than happy to sell their land that had been used up by the farming methods of the period. George Vanderbilt's 250-room French Renaissance Chateau is a true marvel of architecture and artistry. Recognized as America's largest home, Biltmore House required six years of construction and around a thousand workers, ranging from local laborers and craftsmen to internationally known artists. During building, there was a woodworking factory, a brick kiln that made 42,000 bricks a day, and a three-mile railroad spur to bring materials to site. Fillmore is 178,926 square feet. That's four plus acres floor space filled with 35 bedrooms, 43 bathrooms, 65 fireplaces, and three kitchens. Likely introduced by matchmaking family members, George Vanderbilt and Edith Stuyvesant Dresser's romance blossomed over a shared love of reading and travel. They wed in Paris in June 1898. After their four-month honeymoon abroad, Mrs. Vanderbilt arrived at Biltmore in October as the new lady of the house. The Vanderbilts frequently opened their home to family and friends for extended periods of time. In fact, this was George Vanderbilt's original vision for Biltmore, a country retreat where his friends and loved ones could relax. But Mr. Vanderbilt had another more significant dream for his home and estate. It was a chance to showcase his knowledge and progressive ideals, as well as his collection of art and antiques. Today's guests to Biltmore Estate can take pleasure in the results of Mr. Vanderbilt, bringing together the genius and talents of Richard Morris Hunt and Frederick Law Olmsted to create Biltmore Estate. For both Hunt and Olmsted, Biltmore was the culminating projects of their careers. Today, Biltmore Estate represents the best preservation through private enterprise. The revenues needed for the preservation of the estate come solely from the estate's commercial operations, making the National Historic Landmark one of the few historic sites in America still privately owned and completely self-supporting. Biltmore Estates receives no form of government subsidy, grants, or trusts. Further, it pays all property taxes and is one of the largest employers in the area. When George Vanderbilt visited Asheville, North Carolina in 1888 with his mother, the mountains of western North Carolina were considered a beautiful respite from urban life. Passenger train service had come to Asheville in 1880, making this southern Appalachian town a day's journey from New York. A mild climate, fresh mountain air, and hot mineral springs nearby made the area a popular resort. Asheville captivated Vanderbilt. In 1888, he began purchasing land for his estate. 
eventually totaling 125,000 acres. Vanderbilt created a country estate based on European traditions, especially those of England, where the estate was meant to reflect the significance of land ownership, wealth, the pursuit of physical well-being, and the importance of family and friends. Biltmore Estate would exemplify these ideals. The creation of Biltmore Estate was a monumental undertaking. The talented people that created the estate focused around Vanderbilt, the owner, Richard Morris Hunt, the architect, and Frederick Law Olmsted, the landscape designer. There was cooperation, friendship, and respect between Vanderbilt, Hunt, and Olmsted, with Vanderbilt being the visionary focusing the men on the same goal. Three men combined their accumulated experiences, knowledge, and expertise to produce a uniquely American country estate. Hunt was one of the foremost architects of the 19th century who received his former architectural education at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris. He designed private residences and public buildings and actively promoted architecture as a profession. Buildings designed by Hunt include the base of the Statue of Liberty, the Tribune Building in New York, and the Yorktown Monument in Virginia. He was also the architect for palatial private homes for wealthy families. Hunt's work for the Vanderbilts include not only Biltmore, but also Breakers and Marlboro House in Newport, Rhode Island. Olmsted had a similar impressive background. He was the preeminent landscape designer in America. The Olmsted firm had worked on parks and university campuses throughout the United States and Canada, including Boston, Montreal, and Chicago Park Systems and Stanford, Amherst, and Cornell University grounds. One of his most notable accomplishments had been Central Park in New York City. He also knew the Vanderbilt family from his previous work on the Vanderbilt Mausoleum in Staten Island and from his landscaping of George Vanderbilt's home in Bar Harbor, Maine. Biltmore Estate derives its name from Bilt, the region in Holland from which the Vanderbilt family originated, and Moor, the Old English word for rolling upland country. Vanderbilt's estate was to incorporate all the entertainment aspects of the country estates in England, adding the concepts of improving the land and the skills of the people in the area. The original 125,000 acres were to include formal gardens, agriculture, and a village all centered around the 255-room mansion. When Olmsted began working with Vanderbilt and Hunt at Biltmore Estate, he recommended formally landscaping only the 200 acres immediately surrounding the house and to turn the remainder into managed forest and farmland. Olmsted recognized the need to repair and control one of the estate's chief resources, the forest. The land Vanderbilt bought was woodland that had been slashed, burned, and overgrazed. Under Olmsted's direction, Gifford P. Show had brought in to establish practices of forest conservation which he learned in France. The rehabilitation of the forest at Biltmore was without precedent in this country. The forestry efforts at Biltmore were part of an early land conservation movement in America. In addition to management of the forest, the Biltmore School of Forestry was begun as a place to train foresters in this country. An article in 1914 referred to the Biltmore School of Forestry and Vanderbilt by saying, There has been a great change in attitude since the Biltmore School was established. It formed an object lesson that forest conservation was not only sane within itself, but also profitable. The farm operations on Biltmore Estate originally included both horticulture and animal husbandry. The concept of a self-sufficient estate was encouraged through the growing of potatoes and corn and the raising of sheep, pigs, dairy herds, and chickens. Specially designed outbuildings were built on the estate for the agricultural endeavors. The immense estate was also to include a village. This concept was inspired by European estates with the accompanying villages. Biltmore Village, originally the town of Best, was purchased in 1889 by Vanderbilt. At the time, the town consisted of a railway station, two small inns, a grist mill, and a few houses. Construction of the village was underway by 1896. Biltmore Village included cottages, shops, a school, a post office, All Souls Church, 
the train station, a laundry, a hospital, and the Biltmore office building. The brick sidewalks, attractive streetlights, and cohesive architecture created a picturesque village. The focal point of Biltmore Estate was and still is Biltmore House. Hunt designed Biltmore House in the Francis I style after the 16th century French chateau in the Loire Valley. Vanderbilt and Hunt created a significant architectural monument and filled it with fine and decorative arts. The two of them supplemented Vanderbilt's previous collection of books and antiques on buying trips to Europe, where they purchased objects for the Biltmore House. The end result was a 22,000 volume library, furniture from various countries and time periods, an extensive print collection, and sculpture and paintings from important artists. When the major portion of the construction had been completed, Vanderbilt opened Biltmore House to his friends and family during Christmas 1895. A tree stood in the banquet hall decorated with presents for children of employees. A coaching party, distribution of mistletoe and holly, and a dinner were all part of the day's activities. The Christmas tradition set the precedent for entertainment at Biltmore. In the years following the formal opening of the house, Biltmore became the quintessential setting for recreation and amusement. Indoor activities at Biltmore included formal dinners and balls on the main floor of the house, while athletic pursuits took place in the basement at the gymnasium the bowling alley, the swimming pool, and the ping pong table. Outdoor recreation activities included hunting, fishing, riding, coaching, hiking, croquet, archery, and strolling in the gardens. Life on a country estate rested on a combination of participation by both guests and servants. The employees during Vanderbilt's time included stable hands, dairy workers, farm hands, and household help. Inside Biltmore House were the steward, the butler, the valet, the cook, the lady's maid, the housekeeper, the chambermaid, the parlor maid, the laundress, and kitchen staff. About 80 servants worked at Biltmore House and the stable area. Servants thought of Biltmore as a good place to work. Imagine getting paid better than your peers, working for people thought to be kind and generous, and living at a place like Biltmore. It was the staff that enabled the Vanderbilts and their guests to enjoy all the activities that were part of life on Biltmore Estate. George Vanderbilt's vision became reality. His ideas and planning resulted in construction of a 19th century country gentleman's estate, which became a setting for innovative land usage, as well as an environment for guests to be entertained. Today, the history and the legends of Biltmore Estate continue. People we talked to working at the house have a unique feeling for the home. They all were as proud of the house as if it were their own home. Many of them were descendants of the original people that built and worked in the home. They have a bond with the home that a few workers can claim. To them, Biltmore is their house and they treat the people that visit as guests. Continuing the legacy of George and Edith inviting us into their home. Biltmore's gardens and grounds offered the Vanderbilt guests a wide range of leisurely outdoor activities, including horseback, riding, fishing, and playing croquet in the green in the Italian garden. The estate even had its own golf course during the Vanderbilt's era. The Vanderbilts demonstrated an unwavering commitment to their community. Their initiatives included Moonlight School to teach estate workers how to read and write, and Biltmore Estates Industries in which local men and women learned practical skills like woodworking and weaving. Vanderbilt was somewhat of an environmental activist of his time. In 1898, he had started the Biltmore Forest School, which taught the importance of conservation. It was the first forestry school. This was the starting of the idea of long-term management of forests, which was new to the U.S. People had started to notice that the Industrial Revolution was having a negative impact on the environment, and answers to the question of what could be done were starting to be asked. Then when the instatement of income tax in 1913 impacted the estate immensely, George decided acreage must be sold. He started the sale to the U.S. government in 1914, but died of complications from appendix surgery at the age of 51 before it was completed. 
One of his dying wishes was that the sale be completed and for the property to be the start of a national forest. Edith completed the sale and the property became the nucleus of the Pisgah National Forest. I hope you enjoyed our trip to Biltmore House. Please like, share, and hit the bell, and be sure to come back and hit the road with Lisa.